Good morning and welcome to our session at the EU Sustainable Energy Week. We, we are the Passive House Institute and associated other institutes from the International Passive House Association. So our topic is Passive House and Passive House for us means efficiency. Efficiency is the first renewable energy because the more efficient we get, the less energy we have to consume. And today's event is about supporting passive house training uptake at universities. How can we get this done? What's in it for us? My name is Felix Stadler. I'm policy associate at the Passive House Institute. And this is today's schedule. After my short introduction, we will hear about education, educational buildings and what Passive House can do both for the buildings and for the education. So we will have the Passive House building standard, the principles and benefits, then Passive House in higher education, how to teach sustainable buildings, who can learn it, how can we learn it, what's the resources. Then it will be about Passive House on your campus, promotions and campaigns next door, youth engagement especially. Then some examples of Passive House buildings, Passive House campuses and their impact on the universities, on teaching and on their consumption. In the end, we will come back to a question and answer session, which is uh, our open door for your questions uh, in case you have any. Our speakers for today who are supporting us with Passive House training uptake at universities are my colleague Wolfgang Feist, who's the founder at the Passive House Institute. Then Susanne Winkel, she is head of course management at the Passive House Institute. And Yogini Patel, she's head of campaigns at Passive House Trust UK and with us today. And the same for Barry McGarren, he's chair at the Passive Association of Ireland. I thank them all for being here and I wish us all a great session which will start right now if you got your coffee ready. Then I will hand over to my colleague Wolfgang Feist. Wolfgang, stage is yours. Well, a warm welcome also from my side. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, the concept of passive house uh, to you during uh, this very short presentation. Um, yeah, so uh, what is it, a, a passive house? Well, first of all, it's real building. It has been built for several decades right now. Uh, it doesn't look very different from what you normally uh, accept to be a building. Um, so to understand uh, how it works and what it is, we have to look a little bit closer. So let's look at the cross-section of that building that was actually built as a university building. Uh, in the cross-section, uh, we see uh, that we have a quite good insulation, that uh, this insulation is made in a way that we are avoiding additional losses by thermal bridging. And uh, that we use good windows, windows which are available nowadays everywhere on the market. Uh, we make it airtight and we have exceptional good indoor air quality by using a heat recovery ventilation system. And that's it. It's just five principles. But these principles, they have consequences for that building because the Overall consumption for heating of such a building will be reduced by 90%. And this is performance based. So these are real measurements of really existing buildings. So the average consumption of buildings in Europe in this respect for heating is around 130 kilowatt hours per square meter a year. In these passive houses, it's only one tenth of it. So are these savings reliable? Uh, so there is a presentation and a publication just about this, uh, which you can uh, read uh, by following the link given here. And, and I, I just cite one of the figures 
in that publication uh, showing the average consumption of average new construction in uh, Europe compared to the average consumption of passive house settlements, which have already been built, measured consumption. Uh, so what we see here, we uh, really get these uh, around 14 kilowatt hours per square meter in the year on measured consumption in these buildings. So we are really down uh, to this very, very low amount. That's, of course, when a very high contribution uh, to our change of the um, uh, uh, climate impacts and of the uh, energy we use in the buildings. Uh, can we do this also in existing buildings? And the answer here is yes. And it's also already been done. The average consumption of typical existing buildings in Germany, it's around 200 kilowatt hours per square meter a year. And the refurbished buildings, uh, which have been demonstrated uh, what we can do with the same kind of technology, which is used for the passive houses, new ones, uh, is around 85% in this respect. We can also have a look with a thermographic uh, camera. Uh, this is, of course, uh, very interesting uh, to see also from a technological point of view. It's this different kind of electromagnetic wavelengths. We are looking at these buildings. And what you see here is that these uh, warm colors you see here, uh, these are the services of the old building, which isn't insulated very well. And here in front, you see this uh, refurbished building, which almost loses no energy anymore. So this is working. Uh, how much can we save? Well, it's a little bit depending on the kind of building we are dealing with. So uh, if we just do what is normally done, the savings are within a range of uh, 25 to uh, 30 percent uh, in the conventional manner. But if we uh, can do uh, all the uh, passive house uh, measures in an existing building, we will reduce by about uh, 80 to 90 percent and come down to 25 kilowatt hours per square meter a year. There are some buildings where you can't do that because uh, we are protected. You cannot change the facade and then we will only be able to use internal insulation. Uh, but there we still can save about 75 percent. Uh, the key for all of that is the improvement of the components used in the buildings. And let me just show that with an example. This is a typical window and a uh, manufacturer of a window. He comes uh, to the experts. Uh, and when we are looking at these developed new component, we can calculate what the energy losses of that component will be. It might already meet the criteria for a passive house component. And if not, we help the manufacturer to improve his component. And that might take one, two, three, uh, whatever loops. Uh, but at the end, uh, the product will be improved by at least a factor two. It can be up to a factor eight. Uh, so these improved components will be available on the market. And this is the way that the losses in the existing building stock will be reduced step by step. Where can you get further information? Well, there are some of the latest uh, publications. Uh, we have, for example, seen that uh, these kind of buildings at the end uh, can be heated uh, by just one uh, single uh, air conditioning uh, system, split unit system, as published in the latest publication of the University of, of Innsbruck. We have just started a campaign called Efficiency Now, uh, where we tell people what they can do right now uh, in face of the existing crisis with uh, low um, uh, gas delivery from uh, Russia. Uh, so what, what, what can we do right now? And it's a lot of things we can do. And you can find this uh, following the link given here. You find a lot of these informations on uh, Passipedia. Again, uh, 
that passive houses are not just an idea. It's not just a topic of research. Well, there's still a lot of research going on, but it's now a widespread international successful solution. And all these buildings you see here, they are all passive houses or retrofitted existing buildings. What is the impact of this uh, on the real world? Well, it's quite interesting uh, to see because if we really engage in improving the existing buildings, what in Germany has been done in the time between the year 2000 and 2010, uh, you can reduce the heating demand by about 30% in 10 years. And it, it, it just stopped in 2010 because everybody believed that now we have much uh, cheaper uh, natural gas. And so it's not important uh, to do that any longer. And so um, this is uh, what the result would be if we do nothing. And this is the result if we improve our buildings. So this can, of course, be done again. And this way we can uh, deliver uh, what we need to make the energy transformation successful. I thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Wolfgang. Now I turn my microphone on. And uh, Susanne, now my colleague, will tell us about how we implement Passive House in education and how we can learn how to build passive buildings. Thank you, Susanne. Okay, thank you, Felix. And thank you, Wolfgang, for this uh, overview about uh, of the Passive House standard. Uh, yeah, you heard about what's going on with what's the passive house and you heard also uh, why this is really needed, uh, this high energy efficient design uh, in new construction buildings and also, of course, in retrofits and in renovations. Yeah, my part today would be to give you an overview um, about the training offers uh, from the Passive House Institute and from many other cooperation partners. And the training offers that will you enable you to respond to this need um, and to integrate high energy efficiency into your daily pers uh, professional life. Um, yeah, maybe you're wondering at the moment, so uh, this is really a nice concept, but why do I need a special training for this? Yeah, so I don't know uh, which target groups, which people we have in this audience. That's why I want uh, would like to give you a, a bit of an overview or give you a few examples of what you can expect in the respective training offers. So, we, of course, we have more, more different kinds of training offers, but later more about this. Maybe uh, one question you are, you are wondering, maybe um, how you want to live uh, yourself? Maybe you are just in the position of uh, thinking about renovating uh, an old house, an existing building. Uh, or you are uh, thinking about uh, buying a new one or building a new one or just choosing a flat uh, in an existing building. So, and you maybe are unsure how energy efficient uh, this building or your building should be. And maybe you are also wondering whether such a passive house makes sense at all. Uh, so we will give you answers on this in our basics training. Um, and uh, maybe also one question is, or one experience is in the last weeks that um, somebody told you recently it would be the best thing to have photovoltaics on your roof, so using uh, renewable energy. This is, of course, absolutely right. Uh, we, are, we, we really need to use renewable energy in future. And right now, uh, it's no other way than uh, going forward with renewable energy in the future. But maybe referring to photovoltaics and solar, um, solar gains, you are wondering at the moment uh, how to get the needed energy in winter in our cool climates here especially when you think about uh, the large energy demands of conventional buildings in winter, as you can see here with the gray bars at the left side and at the right side of this graph. So the yellow dots are those uh, solar gains with the photovoltaics. So maybe this is a question we would like to give you answers in our special uh, trainings. Maybe you are responsible for the energy orientation of your municipality or of your district, or maybe even your country. 
And also here in this for you, then uh, the Passiforce training will provide you with reliable and with verifiable background information um, to enable you uh, a good decision making process and to think about uh, in which way your municipality should go, maybe also which expert you should consult and so on. Maybe you are uh, on the construction site and uh, you are there um, um, for making sure that all the planning and all the talking uh, is turning into reality. And then you are responsible to ensure a correct implementation of planning of high energy efficient buildings of passive houses. And then the uh, passive house training will give you detailed knowledge and also detailed skills to ensure the high quality of constructed buildings in the passive house standard and high energy efficient standard. It could be also that you are in uh, architects or uh, um, engineering or you are an energy consultant and you want to use science, uh, in this case building science, as a basis for your decisions in your professional activity. Or maybe you are a young person and thinking about which way you want to choose in your for your pro for, uh, future professional activity. Uh, you want to go to um, a construction site or want to go to engineering and how this could affect or Im have an impact to uh, climate change, uh, being part of bringing this forward. Then you will have also the passive force training giving you a scientific background so you can really understand what's going on, what you're talking about in your professional activity, and you can be able to justify and to enforce your own decisions with confidence. Yeah, and so of course, we know uh, in all situations, also in the building sector, uh, all decisions are about money, of course. And therefore, also the passive force training will help you if you want your planning and consultations to be economical, uh, sound and safe, so that you really can be sure that you make the right decisions for your clients, for your own also. And uh, yeah, how can this have an impact to bring things forward? Because if no one can afford, then it couldn't be built. Of course, that's the case. But passive houses, high energy buildings, energy efficient buildings can be afforded and you can prove this by knowing about how you can calculate. Maybe you are uh, into engineering part of buildings and um, uh, with uh, building services and you want or maybe also you need just to deal with the topic of ventilation systems and maybe you're interested and you want to realize how high energy savings can be through efficient building services. So passive houses, high energy efficient buildings are not only about building envelope. Uh, they are the great part, a very important part is also, of course, efficient building service. And that's uh, why uh, we also, of course, included this in our trainings for the uh, craftspeople or people on site, and also, of course, for engineers and architects and energy consultants. Another topic could be that uh, you want to think more about how much energy consumption is caused by your planning in reality. So I'm not sure if you are aware of this, but um, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, it's the case that in most energy balances, which are calculated in accordance with building regulations in Germany and Europe worldwide, uh, this is uh, calculated more, how could I say, more theoretically on paper. So we have factors to calculate this. And at the Passivos Institute, we tried and we made a calculation system that really, can, which you can really see what's going on here. And it's not only a factor, it's really on uh, reality planned. And then you can see how much energy consumption is really caused f uh, because of your decisions from the beginning uh, just to the uh, life of the building. Yeah, so these were some of the contents of the respective passive trainings. And I hope I could interest, it in, uh, interest you for, for this. Um, but of, of course, it's very important for you to see what kind of trainings are offered and where are they offered, of course, and by whom. So the Passive Institute developed a pathway of training 
uh, starting with uh, more basic information. You can find this at the website of the Pacifist Institute as an online version, free of charge, but also at many other uh, partners worldwide. So they have basic information uh, yeah, for your clients also, for yourself, just uh, 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 seeing what is Pacifist about, what is high energy, en energy efficiency is needed for. And uh, then we developed trainings for people working on site. This is called Certified Passive House Tradesperson Training. Uh, there you can choose direction of building envelope or building service, but of course you can also take both parts. Um, and then we developed, you can see here, uh, um, also um, some add-on trainings uh, uh, dealing with special topics uh, in the building sector, like retrofits more in detail, or if you are in charge of uh, large building, um, uh, comple complex buildings on sites, so then you need some more uh, detailed training. And then we have also this training for architects, engineers, building uh, energy consultants. This is called Certified Passive House Designer Training or Consultant Training. And this is going much more into details. Uh, also, we are talking about scientific background here. What I told you before that you need to know um, to understand what you are doing from the scientific uh, topic here. And for this, for the designer training, we also have some add-on trainings, also more in detail retrofits, of course, uh, knowing about uh, energy um, um, calculations, energy balances for more complex, large com uh, projects, or how to deal with commissioning to bring this planning then really into reality. So these are also uh, detailed trainings. Uh, and then at the end of this pathway, uh, after having uh, many experiences with passive houses, so uh, doing many projects and have experience with uh, projects and the building of passive house also, then you could be in the position uh, to help us at the Passive House Institute with all our partners to um, prove uh, the qualification of um, this uh, buildings, so, um, so certify buildings and make sure that the buildings are really uh, be this what they are planned for. So where can you find this training? Um, of course, we at the Pacifist Institute cannot train our people worldwide. This is much far uh, uh, beyond our capacities. And that's, uh, th therefore, we have many course providers all over the world working together with us. We have many corporations. You can find, uh, you see this here on this map, uh, where they are located. And you can find this, of course, more in detail on our website, passivehouse.com slash training. And all those course providers uh, have different kinds of uh, different methods of training. So they are combining online training, in-class training, um, live online, or also e-learnings on demand. So they have really a great mixture also caused by the pandemic because we all have to think about new ways of training methods uh, since the uh, last two years. Yeah. And um, what all have in common is that they offer an exam at the end of the training. And this exam is um, a centralized exam, so to say. That means that at the end of your training and passing this exam, you can get a proof of your qualification as certificate, which is internationally recognized. So because this exam is written the same worldwide for the uh, um, uh, Tradesperson, of course, this is another level of exam. And for the designer training, uh, all these exams worldwide are the same. So you can sure be sure that all certified passive house tradespeople people all over the world have the same knowledge regarding energy efficiency of buildings and the same for designers, engineers, architects. Uh, we started 15 years ago this trainings and uh, we started this with um, uh, people who are already on job, uh, so architects uh, already um, um, educated architects. But then a few years later, we of course started education in universities, and therefore we made many um, cooperations with universities. You will see in the later presentations here also uh, some examples. Um, yeah, and we are doing our best to increase this number of uh, universities cooperating uh, uh, or teaching passive house because it's, um, yeah, it's one of the most important things to make the next generation ready for tomorrow's job market. 
or, or maybe I should better say the need of today, because it's not tomorrow's uh, need, it's the day we need uh, today build our buildings. And for me, it's quite really important that uh, you are not told um, about how to how we built in the past. Uh, you should be told how we build now and in future, and this should be high energy efficient. Uh, yeah, so I would like to thank you for your attention. Here you can find uh, the, our contacts, uh, designer at passive.de if you want to go directly in contact with us. And you can find more detailed information uh, of all these concepts uh, on passivehouse.com slash training. Um, yeah, if you want to take uh, um, courses on yourself, or maybe you are interested also in offering courses. Maybe we have in the audience people who are working in universities. Maybe we have uh, university teachers here or uni university staff. So if you are interested in going uh, farther together with us, uh, telling young generation what they should know for uh, building uh, our future, so you can get in contact with us. Yeah, and uh, the last topic I want to refer here is, uh, I think you all have heard about uh, the nearly zero energy building. So the EU stated this um, as the building standard we should uh, rely on. And uh, the problem is that the EU uh, didn't make detailed um, regulations for this, so every country can choose their own nearly zero energy building detail regulations. Um, yeah, and to be honest, this hasn't worked out very well in the last years, as you know, maybe in your country also. But the EU stated three uh, most important topics how this nearly zero energy building should look like. So it should be highly energy efficient, it should be cost effective, and it should be optimized for using renewable energy. And as you know from the first presentation now, uh, from Wolfgang Feist, and also I try to give you some examples, um, and you will see more examples later in the next presentations. The passive host standard is, uh, has all these uh, uh, three topics in, in the standard. So it's highly energy efficient, it's cost effective, and you can uh, um, use energy, uh, renewable energy for these buildings, and it's optimized for this use. And that's why if you don't have detailed regulations for nearly zero energy buildings in your country, you then just choose the passive host standard, then you can confirm that this is a nearly energy building, uh, nearly zero energy building. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. If you have uh, questions, we can go later at the end of this session to your question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susanne. Very interesting. We also find all the links again in the chat. Uh, we will be posting there all the time. So thanks, Susanne. And now I'll hand over to Yogini from Passive House Trust. She's going to tell us about uh, Passive House engagement, so actions, campaigns. Yogini, please. Thanks, Felix. Thanks, everybody. And uh, good morning. Um, so I'm Yogini. I'm the head of uh, campaigns from the Passive House Trust. Pass Fast Trust is an independent non-profit organisation that provides leadership in the UK for Passive House and its methodology. And we're the official UK affiliate of the Passive House, International Passive House Association. So training and education is a core part of all of our activities and across all sectors and all levels. So that's everything from the general public all the way through to all stages of construction. So from financing and planning, design and delivery, all the way through to final handover and maintenance. Um, and um, today we've already heard about um, what Passive House is and a couple of the training initiatives that are available. And I'm gonna hone in on um, specifically what we're doing in the UK and some new developments that we're working on and why academic initiatives in particular are really important to us. Um, so back in 2019, the UK, um, declared a climate emergency and from that we just saw a massive increase in awareness in um, particularly the younger generation saying that they feel like they're being failed with their education that they don't know enough about the climate crisis um, there was a couple of studies done that was saying a large number so 77 percent of people, students felt that they didn't know enough about the climate crisis and equally on the flip side 75 percent of teachers felt like they didn't have enough training to um, you know, deliver or help 
deliver that education. So it's a hugely important um, topic for us. And interestingly, there have been lots of reports saying, you know, we've got less than 12 years to meaningfully make an impact on the on catastrophic climate um, catastrophe. Um, it actually takes seven years to become a qualified architect in the UK. So it just highlights the importance of why we need to be getting um, this kind of efficiency first education into universities now. Um, so one way that we connect with um, students is via design competitions. A recent one that we've um, completed is the Icebox Challenge in Glasgow. So this was Glasgow City Council's, one of their official activities for COP26. Um, it's a really fun and engaging public installation that increases awareness of um, what passive house is and, and energy saving potentials of more efficient buildings. So one box is built to passive house, the other box is built to um, the national building regulations. So in this case, it was Scottish building regs. Um, they're put on public display for a fortnight and they've got equal amounts of ice in the boxes. And the one which has the most amount of ice remaining is basically the winner. So it's really um, clear visual way of explaining what Passive House is. And we um, attached a design competition to this. So students were actually learning the difference in really simple uh, structures, the difference between Passive House and um, building regulations. Um, they also not only got to see that the winners got to see their designs actually realised, but they also got to take part in the actual construction phase, which is really important. There's not a lot of universities that allow that kind of practical training for designers. Um, so that was huge, hugely beneficial. We also um, increased our partnerships. So there was a lot of um, partners involved with this one project. So Glasgow City Council, Edinburgh and APU University, the Institute, Passive House Trust and um, BEST, which was formerly known as Construction Scotland Innovation Centre. So we had councils, we had manufacturers, we had designers, we have universities, and it's all really positive um, in getting this uh, delivered. And thankfully, the boxes didn't go in the bin. So they're currently housed at um, a college in Hereford, and they're going to be getting a retrofit. So another learning opportunity from these boxes. And it's going to be tagged onto a new design competition. Um, we've had several councils uh, register interest. They would like to do their own icebox challenge. So we're currently working on a demountable version as well. And if you'd like to get involved, this isn't the first icebox challenge. So there've been several across the world. Um, you can go to the website, the international website, and it, you can see kind of how you could potentially run your own. Another design competition we've been involved with um, recently is the 2022 Southside Hereford. So this is a national competition. We partnered with, um, well, the competition was led by the Timber Development UK alongside um, NMITE and Edinburgh and APU University. Uh, we reached 150 students from 57 different universities. We got six shortlisted entries, which are here. I always love this bit because the brief is the same, but you get such different variety in designs. It's always really interesting to see. So the interesting thing about this is it was based on a live project. So there's actual three potential clients there all being housed in a, um, a building. We wanted inter interdisciplinary teams. So again, very different to what you'd normally get at university. You've got a different way of learning. Um, and the design was a community building or a skills hub. Um, built to the Passive House standard and predominantly built from timber. So the students not only had to deal with a really challenging um, brief, they had to kind of tackle the budget as well as the client needs, as well as the energy building performance side of things. Um, this was all delivered online, the teaching. So we hosted almost 80 speakers across 20 webinars um, and they're all now available on YouTube. So you can go back and watch those. The students also got access to um, software such as PHPP, Design PH. They've got loads of tutorials. Um, and the first time they all actually got together, so they, they formed these interdisciplinary teams online, is when they came to the awards ceremony in Hereford. So we had a two day um, ceremony. We hosted site visits. Um, the students got to pre um, present their presentations in front of the judges, which was um, a load of industry experts. They got to network, they did workshops, and they had an actual award ceremony, which was really nice post COVID. 
Um, and there's loads of positive outcomes from this competition. So again, it's it's this is all extra credit work. It's not part of their curriculum. Um, and so all of the winners have basically found jobs with um, quite well established companies. They're very employable now because they've dealt with such a complex brief. Um, and passive house is a really key skill that pe employers are looking for right now. Um, and we are going to be launching a new competition uh, in the autumn academic term, so in October time. So keep an eye on our website for more details. The design competitions are one way of engaging with um, students, but they only kind of reach a couple of hundred students every year. So how can we reach a couple thousand students every year? That's the speed that we need to start um, getting into. Um, a couple of universities at the moment already offer um, graduating with not only your course, but a certified passive house designer course, again, making you very employable. So Susanna touched upon this briefly. Um, we've got the in the UK, we've got the University of Bath, Greenwich, Strathclyde and Southwest College. I think Barry will touch upon that in a bit. We also offer um, academic training. So we um, deliver a very reduced rate uh, academic membership for universities and they you can go to our website and see what kind of benefits we offer there and also individual student membership um, and what I'm really excited to share is that we are also talking to Reba which is the Royal Institute of British Architects so we've currently already delivered um, some CPDs on Passive House specifically aimed at architects and designers uh, we're now also talking to their interim director of education and we are working on developing a training course um, specifically for architecture students that will be available to everybody um, for free in the core curriculum. So that means Passive House will eventually be available to every architect, every architect and every architecture school. Um, we're finalising the funding for this and developing the training materials. Um, as soon as we get that working well, we hope to roll it out to other industry bodies. So looking at um, engineers and surveyors, not just the designers. Um, we've also got um, a partnership involved. I mean, that that designer training is very different to um, other tradespeople or apprenticeships. So we're also looking at more practical ways of um, learning and teaching. So we've got uh, partnerships with BEST and NMITE who are more focused on um, hands-on kind of getting into the construction side of things. We're looking into developing partnerships with the ACB Carbon Light training um, people. So they might become our preferred trainers in the UK. Um, they already have a bite-sized course available, which is a good precursor to the certified passive house training. Um, and they have courses started in September. I think theirs might be sold out, but there are other providers in the UK. So Hopefully the link's in the chat and you can find out a bit more. Um, they also helped us to de develop these interactive CITB passive house modules. So they're all on interactive and on demand. Um, another initiative we've got is an education steering group. So that's linking up with the work that we've already begun with our partners. We're looking at um, assessing what materials we already have, uh, identifying the gaps that we have and what's the most impactful way of getting that training out. So we've already begun with some mapping. Um, we're looking at um, mapping against the Pearson HNC, which is Higher National Certificate Framework, and focusing in on levels four to six, which is the equivalent of a degree in the English degree, uh, years one to three. And to give you some context, the um, level five would be the certified training level, certified passive pass training. And we wouldn't recommend that until um, years four for architects because they don't normally get any practical experience until after three years in university. Um, so that's all ongoing. A few, just quickly, some other training initiatives that we already have available. So we try and have introductory level training available for free to everybody. And then we try and pull out um, more intermediate training from that. So all of these are quite recent. Um, and available on our website. Um, wanted to just highlight the Getting to Net Zero. So there's some free webinars you can go and watch right now. Um, and then there's also some uh, more kind of in-depth um, interactive modules that you can get involved with. And tutors especially have been really um, popular 
on that course. We've also developed a few on-demand interactive modules, like I've mentioned previously, and our retrofit um, campaign is really popular at the moment as well. It's just such a huge issue that people are trying to get their heads around. So lots of these things have free um, introductory videos you can go and watch right now. There's a huge host of resources on our website. Please do go and have a, a little mind through. Um, one that I wanted to highlight were the Passive House um, primers that we've done. So they're some short A4 documents on net zero, embodied carbon and retrofit. Um, some client focused campaigns have been really effective in getting um, intro level and intermediate level training out to people. I just want to highlight the Passive House of Educational Buildings as we're talking about education. So this has been hugely effective in um, getting students are actually asking their universities, what are you doing in terms of getting more out in terms of sustainability? What's the strategy? What's the climate um, strategy? And so we've hosted a whole curated campaign, which has lots of resources and policy, and it's actually helped spark a load of educational buildings ranging in scale. So we've got small scale like community hubs or schools, we've got high schools, and then we've got these massive kind of skyscraper developments that are passive house education. And there's lots of healthy competition between all the universities, which is great. Um, and I'm sure Barry will talk about Earn Campus and um, a few more of those really exciting projects. Um, we've got a few advanced level um, initiatives as well. So we're currently working on our large and complex masterclass that's underway at the moment. Um, and that's also tied in with the UK Passive House Conference, which is happening in October. These events are both free for um, anyone working in local authorities or councils um, or housing associations. So please do come along. Um, again, we've got more training available um, to everybody. So the overheating on demand is available for free. Certifies training is happening later this month. And I'm sure Barry's going to pick up on that because it's in Enniskillen. Um, and we're also working on some technical training. So we've got working groups working on advanced level things like moisture risks and um, retrofit costs. So the key lessons we've learned um, from all of, all of this work is there's such a large amount of work to do and that training needs to happen across all sectors and at all levels. We can't forget one sector or the other, it just won't work. Um, one size doesn't fit all, so we need a multi-pronged approach. So things that work for designers won't necessarily work for contractors and we must empower the trainers. So we need to improve the climate literacy of the tutors before they can um, inform the students. And that was a whistle stop tour, so thank you. Thanks, Eugenie. That was great. Uh, a lot of input and very informative and entertaining. Thanks. You find all the links again in the chat. Uh, there's a lot of resources and we need you on the job and to get to know more about uh, sustainable and healthy buildings. So look up the resources. Now we'll hand over to Barry, who will give us some on hand examples of what uh, the Passive House standard can actually do for your university buildings and not only for your university education. Barry, stage is yours. Thank you, Felix. Uh, can, can I just confirm? Can you hear me? OK, yeah. Yes. Brilliant. Okay, so, so that's exactly what I'm going to do. Um, my name is Barry McCarran, uh, and I currently work at Southwest College, um, which is a, a further education college based in Northern Ireland in the UK. Um, we have had a, an experience now with Passive House since 2015, and um, I, I'm just going to talk through what we've done on our estates and then how it's impacted a lot of what we do. Um, but before I do that, I, I just wanted to, because we're talking about education and because um, we're, we're talking about buildings and estates, um, just to show you that Southwest College are not on their own, um, I have some examples here. This one here is Monash University in, in Australia, and, and that's one of their um, passive house buildings on site. We also have this uh, stunning photograph um, from Cornell Tech. Um, in, in obviously New York there in the States and, and this here really large building you see is a certified passive house building to house student accommodation. Um, 
on site. And then I was fortunate enough to visit this building during the summer. Um, it's Humber College's retrofitted building um, on their campus in Toronto. So uh, again, we're, we're in very good company. And then of course, um, there's ourselves. We have recently just opened this building here, um, which is referred to locally as the Urn Campus. Um, so again, that's a 30 million pound certified passive house building. And it's also built to the premium standard as well. So hopefully that sets the scene. Um, as I said, back in 2015, we built this smaller building here. Um, this was our first uh, venture into the passive house standard. And from then to now is what I'm really going to talk about. We, we started adopting the, the training that Suzanne outlined and Eugenie in, in the presentations um, in 2016. And, and since then, we've, we've trained over 500 designers and tradespersons. We've been involved in, in really, really um, four industry direct projects. And we're now really starting to see a multiplication of all of this, um, which I'm going to come on to in, in due course. So we, we, we teach on site both the tradespersons course and the designers course. But before we sort of get into what we're doing and how the impact has, I think it was good just maybe to frame um, the situation that was going on with our estates and why we went to the Passive House Standard. The building you've seen in the previous slide that was built in 2015, um, it, we were the lead partner on a, on a new European project um, called Crest. And that allowed us to, um, when, with us being the lead partner, we had a capital um, budget within that project and we built that, that, that initial building out of that project. Then when we were looking at our existing estate, that this was the old campus in Inniskillen. Um, it, it used uh, 152 kilowatt hours alone just for heating. Uh, that was going through 100,000 litres of heating oil. Um, Heating oil is the dominant um, source of heating in in uh, Northern Ireland, unfortunately. And at the time, that was costing £51,000. Now, if that was today, this would be almost double. So you're talking up on £100,000. So the economics have, have changed. Um, and, and this is a great illustration of what Wolfgang outlined earlier on in the Efficiency Now campaign as well, in relation to the crisis. So that was our existing situation. Um, we had this lovely site that we were gifted. You can see the relationship there in the photograph to the town and with the lake and everything. It was on the, on the site of an old hospital. So with this, we wanted to build a building that was worthy of the site and um, was to all, all the right things um, in terms of standards and everything else that would equip us and future-proof future, future -proof, um, the college estates going into the future. So we built the Iron Campus. I, I'll not read through this, but the, the overall headline is at the bottom. Um, again, reflective of what Wolfgang was saying, you know, you're talking a 90% improvement from the old to the new. And and if, if we extrapolate this over a typical time frame, which the Department of Education would use in Northern Ireland, you, you're looking at, for each 25-year block, at least a million pounds in running cost savings. Um, uh, usually 50 years is, is what they would calculate. So that's at least 2 million. And that, that is very conservative, not taking into account rising energy costs or, or that. Also, since we've opened, um, we've got some data that we can just briefly share with you. So, I mean, the building's designed to be at 21 degrees. And uh, from it opened, or from we started monitoring in October through to July this summer, the building is performing at 21 degrees. So really happy with this. Um, and then with respect to CO2, it, it, the, the figures are fantastic. Again, from October to July, we're, we're just less than 500 CO2 parts per million, which is really, really good uh, indoor air quality as well. But here's where, where, where we really want to you know, delve into how this can have an impact on students, how it can have an impact on what the college does with its curriculum, how the college maybe interacts with industry as well. And, and to, to kick off with that, I'm just going to talk about um, two opportunities which we realized in the summer. Um, post 
EU in the UK and um, the the replacement funding for for a, a, a very well known EU um, part of money or funding was um, Erasmus. What replaced it was a scheme called the Alan Turing scheme. Now our college was very successful because Passive House is a global standard, and because there's other colleges in the world doing what we are doing. We reached out to these colleges and, we, and, and like Eugenie was outlining, you know, tried to develop strategic partnerships. And, and these two are good examples of this. The first one was we were able to take a group of students from Northern Ireland to Humber College um, in Toronto, where um, we also brought a teaching team and we taught um, a high performance building module as part of their summer school for three weeks um, to a whole host of students from all over the world. Um, that was very successful and it's now going to be a multi-year um, program. And, and then this other photograph here under Penn State, that was another trip you, also with the touring scheme where we took a group of our students again and, and tutors across to Penn State. And again, like the Humber one, this, this looks like it's going to be a multi-year um, relationship as well. And we're hoping to expand on that um, and, and reach more organizations locally, more locally as well as the international ones. Then with respect to, you know, our teaching and, and how we, you know, take what we're seeing in industry. Um, my department in the college is the business facing arm of Southwest College and we um, take, take money um, from various funding streams. Um, and we, we carry out research and development with, with industry um, on an ongoing basis. Some of those projects are very, very short with a wee bit of knowledge transfer. Others are very strategic projects. But we take what we learn um, from industry and we show um, the curriculum, what, what we're doing. Uh, and, and one of the things that the people in our team use on a daily basis is the passive house softwares such as Design PH. Uh, and to date, we haven't really ventured down the road of, of every student using this yet, but we're going that way. But we do um, for for all years and, and for, for various classes, we do demonstrations of this a couple of times a year. And um, we would also talk them through a, a little bit more of the, de the detail of, of where you do your design pH modeling and then how you would transfer that across into a PHBP. And we use that to sort of talk about all the various elements of the building, the importance of good components. We're, we're able to, to demonstrate on screen, well, if you use this not so good window and you put in a very, very high quality window, just what effect that has. And it's, it's really good at getting across some, some points as well and showing them the, the, the impact that these decisions have on overall energy use. Then we, we, you know, in addition to, you know, the, 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 the core training materials, let's say, that, that are available, we also bring in then other things, um, ones that are very attractive for them to see. We show them some thermal modeling, again, demonstration rather than, than equipping them at the moment. Um, for, the, for those that do BIM and do part-time BIM courses, um, we, we, we show them that there's a, an equivalent there as well to convert to PHPP. And then also, I think this at the bottom is very important as well. Um, a lot of construction in the UK is, is masonry, but for timber constructions as well as masonry, we're, we're talking about um, the, the potential impacts of doing things wrong and then showing them the two woofy um, just to, to demonstrate what can go wrong. Um, in addition to this as well, there's also good visualization tools that um, our, our partners uh, of other affiliates uh, in, the, in the US have produced and we show them. So this is a very good one here, just showing a, a normal building and it shows you just, just each what each of the windows are doing in terms of heat gains here in the red or heat losses. And this is very good for teaching students about the building form, having windows on, on the various orientations. And again, just, just making them think about you know what they can do when when, when designing buildings in concept stage and, and the same goes on with this there's more and more tools coming out but we we show them the the very uh, attractive tools internet-based tools that they can use 
and then last but not least in in, in this suite of of so-called softwares we we have um ph ribbon which is the body carbon tool that, that sits alongside the, the passive house methodology at the moment and again in body carbon as we know you know passive house is dealing with operational carbon and knocking it out of the park but the the next challenge is really going to be around in body carbon and then we, we've got a full solution um and, and again we're using this tool to show them the importance of that as well so for us in the college um it, it our, our our experience with passive house has been huge i, I would say transformative um our estates are obviously benefiting with two buildings now out of seven that are passive house so our ongoing running costs and now that we're in an unfortunate crisis with regards to energy that's good for the college um it, it is it is um demonstrating leadership um within the education sector and we've had a lot of people come to us see the building and want to implement the same and not just within education also also other public sector bodies so the building, I suppose, it looks like has broken the glass ceiling in the Northern Ireland context, um, which is very exciting for us as well. Um, but then moving away from those savings and, and ongoing savings just coming off the building, it's much more than that. Um, you've seen in the presentation the opportunities that we're able to afford our students now through this. Um, but also that like Eugenie was saying, and, and then there's very exciting developments going on with the trust as well. Um, we're really starting to impact education and, and tool up young people for, you, you know, uh, to, to, to impact on the climate emergency and to build buildings um, in a much better way than they have been built before. So for, for our college, um, very, very successful. Um, and we, we, we have a lot of things ongoing and planned. One of them is, as Eugenie outlined, we're, we're hosting the entire IFA camp um, at the end of the month. And, and that's really another tangible outcome, having got into Passive House. So all, all in all, really good. So I look forward to um, questions, I think, now as well. Uh, thanks, Barry. Not yet questions, but they'll come in a bit. I will have some event announcements before. But uh, thank you for that uh, presentation. It was really good. And I'm excited to now invite you to some more Passive House events, as for example, the International Passive House Conference in 2023, which we are going to hold under the motto of Efficiency Now. How can we reduce our dependency on fossil fuels? I can give you a hint. Passive House is one of the keys to it, and it's going to take part, uh, going to take place in 10th on 10th and 11th of March in Wiesbaden in Germany. There will be lectures, exhibitions, networking, excursions, and you will also be able to take part online. So if you're interested, look it up on PassiveHouseConference.org. We also have the uh, QR code here. Then the IFA, the International Passive House Association, which will have the camp in Enniskillen, uh, has a webinar schedule of uh, very interesting presentations on some projects, like, for example, the Ken Sobel Tower in Ontario, uh, where they retrofitted a large-scale building um, in a very uh, impressive way. That already has taken place. I'm sorry. <laughs> but the next one, October 5th, uh, could be interesting for you. That's also about retrofit. How can we ensure high quality retrofits in a time when retrofits could save us our uh, climate balance? And then November 2nd and December 7th. You can see it on the International Passive House Association's website too. We will have the International Passive House Days, uh, Passive House Open Days on the 11th to the 13th of November. Look it up on the website. Maybe there's some Passive House residents or Passive House schools, Passive House buildings, wherever in your neighborhood, which open up for you to take a look and to see that it's uh, just a normal home, but it feels better and it saves more energy and more emissions. So our associations, as I told the International Passive House Association, I will also post the link again. And for any German uh, spectators, we also have the IG Passive House. That's a German branch of it. 
And now we come to questions and answers. So feel free to share and ask whatever's on your mind. Thank you for your attention. And uh, thanks to my speakers for their kind presentations. Okay. So no questions yet, but I had one for Barry anyways. <laughs> really? uh, yeah, I uh, realized in your presentation, you said here um, with the design pH that the, the red windows showed the heat gains and the blue windows sh showed the heat losses. Now I'm working now for over a year for Passive House Institute. I know what that means, but I could imagine that some of the uh, people in the audience don't already know what the what heat gains and heat losses over windows mean like how uh, is that connected to the passive house principle could you just explain it shortly yeah no problem at all felix so um what's really really good about th that illustration that was on screen if you can recall it um is that obviously with any building you have four sides to it um and one of the things within the passive house methodology to understand is and Wolfgang mentioned it was high quality windows, but not only do you have high quality windows, you also have to consider the amount of them and which orientation they go on. Now, obviously, with with all design, the buildings are designed and, and lighting is an important consideration. Aesthetics is important consideration, but all too often I feel our students are not taught enough about unintended consequences with respect to energy. Um, so I feel that with windows and, and their respective um, orientations where they're put is, is an important training nugget for them to have. And in particular, in this part of the world, if you have significant windows on the north side of a building, you, you can really impact negatively the energy balance of the building. And, and I think that little visualization demonstration that we do with them is quite strong in making them understand this. But for the audience, um, essentially, if if you've windows on the south side of a building where, where the sun will, will hit most of the, the building throughout the day, you're likely to get an energy gain. And if they're on the north side, which is on the cold side of the building, you're likely to get losses. So, so hopefully that's a good articulation of it. It is. Thank you. No, it's totally logic. You just get to get behind it once. It was uh, puzzling to me the first time I thought about it because it's totally logic, but you don't think about it. <laughs> Thank you, Barry. Uh, as we are talking about northern weather now, I would also have a question for uh, Susanne, northern climate. Um, you mentioned that there could be a problem with uh, with uh, winter heating in our uh, in our climate zones, that uh, renewables are a good idea and photovoltaics too, but there could be a problem with winter heating with them. Could you explain that for a moment? Yeah, that's. Uh, I think it's quite quite easy. So if you have, um, uh, um, I'll, let me go from this side. If you have. Uh, um, uh, uh, less insulated um, and building envelope and you have photovoltaics on the roof then you can get the energy in uh, for example if you have energy solar energy in winter if it's sunny if, if it's a sunny day then you have a bit of energy for the photovoltaics for your home but uh, the energy is not cannot be saved in this house because this house is not well insulated and if you have now the case that uh, most uh, as it's, it's like most parts of winter time it's cloudy it's not enough energy the sun is uh, getting down but more you have not enough sun uh, uh, sun hours and um, then you have no energy or less energy very few energy from the solar panels or from the photovoltaic panels and you have a bad insulated building so what do you do you need other uh, energy so it's uh, fossil fuel it's uh, uh, atomic power, whatever, and that is why. Um, uh, so some some calculations you find all over the world saying that you have uh, um, zero energy buildings and or you have, for example, class energy buildings, and if they don't have a good in, um, insulated um, envelope of this building, then most people count for the whole year. So they are saying, I have so much uh, solar energy for my house in summer. 
uh, and uh, this brings uh, gives me more energy than I need. But they forget that they get the solar energy in summer and they have the need in winter. So it doesn't fit together. And then we have lots of uh, solar energy in summer, but we need to take fossil fuels or atomic power in winter because we don't have this uh, uh, solar uh, gain in winter time. So th that's why, of course, renewable energy is one of the most important things we have to do in future. But if we don't take the good insulated envelope together with the solar energy, then it's, it's we cannot need we cannot use it in winter time. So the atomic power has to run the we will need fossil fuels in winter time, despite we have photovoltaics on our roof. So that is the uh, thinking behind this. And most people are not seeing this and it is really I think kind of tragic <laughs> for me. Thanks, Susanne. So let's stay with uh, first hand experiences. Wolfgang, you've been living in a passive house now for almost thirty years if I'm calculating right. Is it, uh, did anything change within these 30 years? You're heating with renewables, right? Yes, the uh, first experimental passive house, which, uh, which we had built uh, in, uh, uh, actually in uh, 1991, uh, we are now living as four families uh, in this, uh, in this uh, row of houses. And the overall consumption in these buildings, uh, we are stable since uh, 32 years uh, with a range of about 10 kilowatts per square meter in year. So it's even a bit better than the, than the actual international standard. Um, there were photovoltaic elements added to the building uh, uh, now uh, six years ago. And uh, of course, now it is uh, completely uh, uh, self uh, uh, providing uh, energy, so it's also a demonstration of that that is possible. So it's possible to go to a completely uh, sustainable energy uh, system, even uh, within a region, even uh, within a city or where, wherever you are. That's very good news. Thanks for that insight, Wolfgang. Uh, Yogin, I also got one for you. <laughs> the, uh, of all the engagement uh, campaigns that you had, uh, what's the part of the engagement they enjoy the most? Is it the designing? Is it seeing that it works? Is it putting their hands on it? Is it uh, spreading the word? What's the part of it? I think it's it's a lot of all of that, but it's also exploring what is um most useful to the students really i think that's the most exciting bit so getting as employable as possible is really important to them because they're obviously in competition with you know trying to get a job but also just the, the previous competition we've just done was quite a new element this inter interdisciplinary learning so most of your university life you will go into like your silo of you're an architect, you're an engineer, you're a planner, and you don't normally get to mix with each other until you get into practice. Um, so that was really exciting for them because they'd never had to do that. They'd never had that interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, it was really hard, I'm not gonna lie, but it was, it was really, they found that really beneficial. So that was really nice to see, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Now, that raises another question. Do you have to be an architect or an engineer or anything, a building physicist, building scientist to uh, become a passive house designer? That would be an interesting question maybe for Susanna. Turning on my microphone. <laughs> um, so this training uh, is open for everyone. Uh, we have, um, of course, it's uh, uh, the training for the designers um, is also meant to be uh, that clients who want to build their homes or want to get their homes planned or their houses, their buildings planned, uh, have the possibility to find highly educated uh, people regarding energy efficiency. And that's why we are putting those uh, passive house designers when they are certified and uh, consultants and tradespeople on our uh, website. So there's a website uh, where you can find uh, passive house designers are experts in your region. And um, the, the thing is that if you are 
if a client wants someone who really builds his single home, he needs someone who can do this. And that's why we made it the, same, the distinction between Passive House, uh, Certified Passive House Designer, the, this title, and the Designer Certified Passive House Consultant. So the Certified Passive House Designer is someone who is really an architect or an engineer, civil engineer, who can really build or plan your house and get all the uh, signature on your papers and whatever you need for your home. But maybe you are, um, you have a great project, uh, a, a large project, come more complex project, and you need, for example, a specialist for maybe you are planning a passive house uh, um, uh, swimming bath or so, swimming pool so um, then then you need really specialists and maybe this are not uh, trained architects so with a degree of an architect but they are people more in detail going in special topics also have the same knowledge of passive house they pass the passive house uh, Exam, but they will get the passive house, the title passive house consultant instead of passive house designer. So both titles are the same regarding the level of knowledge, but they are different regarding um, what um, uh, what um, former education they have. So designers are people who uh, are architects, civil engineers, really can get along with the plannings, and uh, consultants are mostly uh, people who are um, yeah, in, from, other, um, from other education topics, maybe more specific or maybe also more uh, into politics. So also uh, very interesting uh, um, uh, fields of activities regarding pacifists, of course. OK, thank you. Now that we, yeah, uh, I remember Barry told me he doesn't have to go to the office today because it's the national uh, holiday uh, in the UK for the for the Queen's uh, death. My condolences at this point. Um, but I'm now I'm seeing you sitting here in your office at home probably, and I was wondering, um, how does it? Are you living in a passive house? Myself? Yeah. No, no, I'm living in, in a 1970s bungalow, but the good news is right across the road is a, an ongoing retrofit right at this moment. Um, Perfect. I, uh, yeah, <laughs> they're, they're flat out of work. Um, external wall installation is going to go on today, I think, the start of it. So, um, yeah, really okay. excited. Really excited. Yes, because, yeah, my question would be, do you, have you already been working in that Ernie campus building? Yeah, thank you, Felix. I know you're going with the question. Um, at my own office is at the Crest Centre, and then I have been spending an awful lot of my time this 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 last year in the Urn campus from it opened, and I shared with you in the presentation some of the data. Um, it, it, it is fabulous um, places to work in terms of uh, building performance. It, it, if you consider the existing building stock in the college, um, we would have buildings that we might have um, it, small insulated tin roofs. And in the summertime, it, those, those office environments can be very, very warm. You can be on a phone or a call like this and you can hear rain um, on days. Um, and, and then in some of the other buildings with normal roofs, we, we, can, we suffer a lot from solar gain um, in other rooms and it can make them quite uncomfortable teaching environments. Um, but it, with the passive house stock that we have, um, it's excellent for teaching. The, you, you've got good indoor air quality, a lot more um, people bright and awake and everything. And then in, in the large urn campus now, it's just it's a different world. So thank you. Yeah, that was where my question was going. I was about to ask if uh, your new passive house office is also in a comfortable environment. And the question was, yes, perfect. So one last question I would have for Wolfgang. Uh, we heard now, okay, passive houses in Northern Ireland, in the UK with us, um, but does it work in every climate zone, the passive house principle? And what's the conditions? What's the things you have to uh, adjust? Is it possible? Well, actually, we now have examples uh, almost everywhere on this planet. And the uh, highest challenge is, of course, uh, the Arctic cycle, but uh, there is actually a passive house in Antarctica. Uh, I, I'll uh, give you the link uh, later. 
Um, now, uh, also in hot climates where we do not have any heating demand anyhow, but uh, we might have a lot of cooling demand. But the same principles which allow us to save energy for heating will also allow us uh, uh, saving energy for cooling. This is what the icebox challenge is uh, also really demonstrating for you. Insulation is not uh, to keep it warm. Insulation is to separate between a environment which is too hot or too cold from an environment which is comfortable inside. So it works in both places for the hot climates and for the cold climates. So there are now already uh, a lot of examples also in very hot climates, for example, in Dubai uh, and in Mexico and in southern China, even in hot and humid climates uh, in India and in um, Bangladesh. So we have uh, examples for passive houses working uh, everywhere on the planet. Uh, there's one thing to mention, that is that the passive house is not a approach with buildings which are flown in by a helicopter and placed somewhere, uh, produced in some um, industry uh, somewhere on the planet, but it's a planning process taking into account the environment we are in, uh, the climate we are in, the building tradition we are in, uh, lots of traditional Chinese uh, buildings, for example, retrofitted to uh, NFIT, which is the passive house standard for existing buildings. So uh, the PHPP and the design uh, PH Barry was talking about, these are tools which uh, give you the, the uh, opportunity uh, to design your building in a way where it will consume uh, much less energy. Yeah. And it's not to fly in something from anywhere, but it's to use the know-how, to, to use the building science to improve the planning process uh, for uh, your special development. And this is working everywhere on the planet. It's working everywhere on this world. Now, my background is physics, so it's again proving that the laws of physics, they are working everywhere, not just on the planet, they are working in the whole universe. Thank you. That was a good sentence for the ending. And still, I would like to ask a second question to Yogini, because we still have 10 minutes of time and that would be a pity. So uh, if you, uh, I could imagine now in the audience, there's quite some people, students, maybe just graduates, and they are thinking it's actually a very good idea. What can I do to uh, get into touch with uh, my university? What can I do? Mm, to set up some initiatives, to set up something, to learn my, to take my first steps. Do you have any experiences, any hints for people who now think like, yeah, I want to start something like uh, the Icebox Challenge or a design competition in my university? Yeah, so thankfully, the students are the ones that are driving the change, really. They're, they're really looking for, they know that they need to know this stuff already. They, so that that's really encouraging. They want to learn more. Um, there are um, quite a few different ways. So you have to kind of understand what level you're at at, at the beginning, but get involved with as much as possible. Um, so you, you, there are students that are campaigning and talking to their tutors and saying, you know, what can we do better? What are you doing? What's the general kind of strategy for the university? So that is working. Stu the universities are listening because in effect, their students are their clients. They have to listen. Um, there's also a lot of campaign groups available, particularly for students. So the Architecture Climate Action Network um, is geared out of <laughs> a lot of architects in particular, just being frustrated with the lack of standards um, being of a, of a better quality or to, the, to where we need to get to for net zero. So they're actually coming together as industry professionals um, and trying to drive change that way. So there's loads of free resources available in terms of webinars, in terms of um, actual campaigning groups. So there's loads to get involved with. And then obviously people like the Institute or the Passive House Trust, there's lots of information available to try and get involved. We hold a lot of um, heavily discounted things for students. So 
if you do want to get involved with um, the conference or like a masterclass, that is normally available for students. Um, so yeah, there's lots of ways to get involved. And obviously the design competitions are one aspect, but if you're not a designer, then you know you need to find another route. Okay, thanks a lot. And at this point also, thanks to you all. Uh, thanks to my colleague Francesca that I didn't uh, mention at the beginning. She was here to help me moderate and to organize everything. Take a look at the chat. There's a lot of resources we mentioned and we put links to. If you want to get engaged with Passive House and know more about it, tell your friends about it. It's a good approach and we can uh, save energy and uh, also help the planet by building healthy buildings. And I think that's a very good idea to do. So I thank everybody who uh, spoke with us here today. And thank you for answering the questions. And uh, I wish you all a wonderful week. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.